When you think of amazing art history discoveries, you might think about x-rays revealing long lost paintings, or archaeologists digging up Egyptian tombs, or even someone finding a masterpiece in their grandma's attic. But I want to tell you a story about a remarkable discovery that didn't involve any excavating or even high-tech equipment. All it took was removing a frame. And a warning to First Nations viewers that this video contains images of people who have died. It's a great puzzle. I mean, it calls everything into question. What's so shocking is how absolutely brazen this is. This might be the most famous First Nations woman you've never heard of. Her name was Truganini. She was born around 1812, and she was called the last of the Tasmanian Aborigines. Because of this mythology, Truganini became somewhat of a celebrity in 19th century Tasmania. Several artists made portraits of her, she was photographed later in life, and her image circulated in the Australian press and beyond. But Truganini was not the last Aboriginal Tasmanian. And this isn't Truganini. I'm Gay Sculthorpe, I'm a Palawa woman from Tasmania and I've spent most of my life working in museums and cultural heritage. Palawa people are the Aboriginal people of Tasmania today and they are descendants of the original Aboriginal inhabitants of Tasmania. Let's do a quick history refresher. The island we now call Tasmania was inhabited by its indigenous peoples for over 40,000 years. In the early 19th century, it was colonised by the British. Back then it was called Van Diemen's Land, and it was one of Australia's earliest penal colonies, where Britain sent its convicts as punishment for crimes such as theft, manslaughter, and even administering a pregnancy termination. In fact, that is exactly the crime that caused an English engraver and portraitist from Birmingham named Thomas Bock to be transported to Tasmania in 1824. Although he had a wife and kids, Thomas Bock had gotten his young mistress pregnant and provided her with abortive drugs, for which he was sentenced to transportation for 14 years. But lucky for Thomas, when he arrived, the new colony was desperate for printers and engravers. Remember, this is a time before photography. So once he had served his sentence, he was able to establish a profitable business for himself, making portraits and prints. It was in the early 1830s that Thomas Bock was commissioned by a man named George Augustus Robinson to create a series of watercolour portraits, 14 in total, of a group of Palawa people. And then he made copies. There is a complete set in Hobart, there is a complete set in London, there is a complete set in Oxford. The mythology of the supposed dying race of the Tasmanian Aborigines was popular amongst colonists and people back in England, and many people wanted their own set of the portraits. And this is where it gets complicated. It is a beautiful, sunny, chilly morning in Hobart. Uh, I'm on my way to TMAG. They're very kindly bringing out their set of the Thomas Bach portraits for me to see. Hi Mary. Hi Jane. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you so much for having me. Are you able to tell me a little bit about the significance to TMAG's collection that these, these pictures have? These were some of the first works to be presented to the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery. So they were presented to the Tasmanian government in 1889, I believe. We have here the third set he produced. So the original sets in the British Museum. There is a set which was commissioned by Lady Jane Franklin, which was created in 1837. And then we have this set, which was commissioned by the Reverend Henry Dowling. And we believe that this was probably copied from the Lady Jane Franklin set and not from the original set, which is in the BM. Don't let my nodding here mislead you, I was getting very confused as well. There's so many versions and copies of these pictures, so let's break it down. So there's the first set, the original set, made by Thomas Bock between 1831 and 1837, and that's in the British Museum. Then there's a second set, called the Lady Jane Franklin set, commissioned by, you guessed it, Lady Jane Franklin in 1837. And this might be the set in Oxford at the Pitt Rivers Museum, or it could be the set in the Turnbull Library in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The jury is still out on that one. Then there's the set in Hobart, the one that Jane and I are looking at here, and that was copied from the Lady Jane Franklin set in 1838. And there's another set at the Art Gallery of South Australia, and alongside the original set at the British Museum, there is also a set of copies made by an artist known only as G. Gray in 1856. These were commissioned by Dr. Joseph Barnard Davis, the same guy who would later buy the originals. So when he died, the British Museum got both the original set by Thomas Bock 
and the G Grey copies. Not many people have looked at the complete set of these portraits. And so to improve the catalogue records, I started to transfer the records from Joseph Barnard Davis's catalogue onto the database. And in doing so, I was rather puzzled because there seemed to be an error in the information. Errors in catalogue records and museum databases are not uncommon. So I want to provide you with a bit of context as to why this particular error and what Gay discovered next is so important to Tasmanian history and Australian history more broadly. Thomas Bock was in Tasmania during the time of the Black War, when relationships between the colonists and Aboriginal people were at their violent uh, worst. And Aboriginal people were being removed from their traditional lands to islands off the coast of Tasmania to make more space for the colonists. There was many violent confrontations between the colonists and Aboriginal people. There were deaths on both sides, but it was overwhelmingly uh, the Tasmanian Aboriginal people who were killed. I'm trying to understand the period known as the Black War a bit better by looking at articles published in the 1830s in Tasmania. Just after doing a few keyword searches, I found an article from 1830, and it's an account of a group of Palawa people uh, attacking the home of a white settler and uh, burning it. Then takes a pretty disturbing turn. It says, We've also heard of numerous other atrocities committed by them within the last week. Extermination seems to be the only remedy. There are, if you can imagine, even more details to this newspaper's position. I think what's so shocking is how absolutely brazen uh, this is. And it's so easy to find. And yet we don't talk about this part of our history nearly enough. Yeah. During the Black War, Truganini herself was displaced and most of her family were killed. In 1829, she became part of a group accompanying George Augustus Robinson, who was traveling around the island on a so-called friendly mission, conciliating with the Aboriginal people. And it was during her time with Robinson that she sat down in front of Thomas Bock to have her portrait made. The original set of portraits by Thomas Bock made around 1831 to 35 are untitled and unlabeled. He didn't write the names on these pictures. But the set copied by G. Gray in 1856 are labeled, as are most of the other copies around the world. And it was when she was looking at the copies by Gray that Gay Sculthorpe made a remarkable discovery. On this copy, which is a portrait of a woman labelled Truganana, a previous old spelling of Truganini, hidden in the bottom corner is a faint pencil inscription. I was able to see these out of their mounts and out of their frames. This inscription is in a hand that is very distinctive. This is very much the hand of Joseph Barnard Davis. And on this particular image, it says, he says, this is not the trusted Truganana. And this wasn't the only clue that this portrait was not Truganini. You see, in many other portraits of Truganini, whether they be in sculpture, in painting, or in photographs, she wears a shell necklace. We know um, that Truganini wore her shell necklace. It, it seems that she wore it all the time. And, and for her not to be wearing it for a portrait would be very unusual. It was Joseph Barnard Davis who noted in his catalogue in 1866-67 that it was Truganini who was wearing the shell necklace. But the portrait that has been reproduced everywhere up until then as Truganini is a woman who is not wearing a shell necklace. Shell necklace making is an art form and cultural practice of deep significance to Palawa people and it continues to this day. But there's another portrait of a woman in the same series by Bock who is wearing a shell necklace. Although the various copies of this portrait all around the world have been labelled with the name Water Bawidji, on the bottom corner of the copy by Gray, Gay found another inscription that read, This is Truganini. I realised that there had been a historic mix-up 
between Truganini and a woman called Water Bawidji. We don't know as much about Waterbawidji as we do about Truganini, but we do know that before she was a member of Robinson's group, she was likely a victim of sex trafficking by sealers on Flinders Island, and that later she married Tana Minowait, who Bok also made a portrait of. But how did this mix-up happen? How did the names of these two women get switched around? It's a great puzzle, the, inscri the inscriptions, because other scholars tried to work out all the inscriptions and all the different sets of the Thomas Bock portraits. And it is mind-bogglingly difficult to do because between the sets of portraits, they differ. Thomas Bock would have met these people and he would have known them as individuals. But when he was doing his later copies, the Aboriginal people weren't in Hobart, they were exiled on Flinders Island. And he himself would not have seen these people for perhaps five years or more. So perhaps he made an error and then his error were repeated by subsequent people. Thomas Bock must have made this error sometime before the 1850s, because not only do Gray's portraits from 1856 get the names wrong, but also a painter named Robert Dowling used Bock's portraits as references for his own pictures in oil paint, and then to create this large-scale group portrait which now hangs in the Queen Victoria Museum in Launceston, Tasmania. Next to the painting, the museum has hung an original sketch by Dowling, which is labelled with names, showing that he definitely believed this sketch by Bock to be Truganini. Bock's watercolours have long been considered the most sympathetic images of Palawa people from the period known as the Black War, compared with Benjamin Dutero's Conciliation, which idealises George Augustus Robinson as a white saviour figure, or John Glover's depiction of Palawa people as nameless and faceless decoration in his idealised landscapes, or the countless ethnographic drawings by European artists and scientists that perpetuated notions of racial difference in order to dehumanise First Nations people. Compared to these, Bock's portraits have more of a sense of individuality and humanity, but knowing that it was likely Thomas Bock himself who made this error, really throws into question just how well he knew these people. I feel a little uncomfortable calling these portraits. Um, I often think of portraits as an equal exchange between the sitter and the artist. Um, I don't believe that the people he was betraying were necessarily willing to have their images taken. I think the notion of a young, attractive Aboriginal person was something that was appealing in the 19th century as a way of being complimentary about Tasmanian Aboriginal people and about Truganini. Whereas the other portrait that I believe is Truganini has a different characteristic. And I think if you look at this portrait, she's looking rather, in a sense, tired, worried, worn out. And at the time that Bock was drawing these portraits, Truganini had been traversing all of Tasmania with George Augustus Robinson in terrible conditions. Life was very hard. So if you see them together, um, I think there was some appeal for people believing Truganini to be this beautiful young woman, whereas in fact, she'd lived a very hard life and a difficult life. In the final years of her life, it's recorded that Truganini was worried that when she died, her body would be taken by European scientists and dissected. And horrifyingly, she was right. She's the most famous Tasmanian Aboriginal person, partly because she was deemed, wrongly, to be the last Tasmanian, and also because her skeleton was on display for many years in the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery before it was returned to the Aboriginal community and returned um, to the sea in 1976. It's probably only been since the 1970s when pioneering historians like Lyndall Ryan began to write histories of Aboriginal Tasmania that people began to look at the portraits of these people in a new way, not just remnants of a dying race, but people who had active lives, each worthy of their own attention. They're really important in kind of telling us something about, you know, these people who are pictured before us and a little 
about who they were, um, despite the fact that it might be, you know, through the eyes of Thomas Bock, you know, an English convict. One always needs to look and relook and relook, and people will respond in individual ways to what is a very rare and precious body of artistic material that we're so pleased has survived. I'd like to thank Professor Gay Sculthorpe for generously agreeing to this interview and curator Jane Stewart and the whole team at the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery. I'd also like to thank my Patreon supporters who help make videos like this possible.